Um, tonight's panel is called New Left in Re Regress, the Militant Turn in the Late 1960s. Um, this period of the New Left in the 60s has been one of a kind of central importance to the project since we uh, began. Um, essentially looking at the moment of the 1960s and the political trajectory of the, of the decade and the generation known as the New Left, um, in order to understand how both the problems established uh, on the old left, um, the 1930s communist old left, uh, were repeated in more or less conscious ways during the 1960s, and yet were not resolved there, um, but in fact, in fact, across that, that decade and through that, the work of that generation, that political generation, further uh, obscured and uh, ensconced in the, the political imagination of the left, such that today we're really dealing with a kind of uh, repetition, a problem of repetition, and, and in many ways this is what Platypus understands to be regression, the problem of a kind of unconscious repetition. Um, I'll allow the panelists to further elaborate that thesis through their specific uh, uh, case studies of this period. Spencer Leonard will be beginning and discussing the, um, the weather underground, the militant turn uh, in the student organization, Students for Democratic Society. Um, he'll be followed by Greg Gorellis, who will be speaking on the gay liberation movement. Um, and lastly, Pamela Gallas will speak on the Black Panther Party uh, and the trajectory of its politics. Um, so without much further uh, introduction, I will just turn it over to Spencer, and each panelist will give a, a, a about a 10 to 15 minute presentation. Maybe longer, maybe shorter, I'm not sure. Uh, how, how well they've been able to condense their ideas. And then we will open it up to uh, Q&A from the audience. And uh, we'll close out the first day of, of the convention, or rather the second main day of the convention uh, tonight. Thank you. Uh, and here's Spencer. These are very preliminary remarks. I hope they will at least initiate a, a strong conversation. At the beginning of the 1960s, C. Wright Mills identified the predicament facing his time as the collapse of the very project of subjectivity, the disbelief in the shaping by men of their own futures, whether as history or as biography. This collapse was above all an intellectual problem the ending of political reflection, a mechanical reaction, not a creative response, to the ideology of Stalinism. Self-coordination of desires with defeat, with the result that a weird complacency suffused his post-war era. The celebration of the new labile and flexible can-do attitude of the affluent society, Mills argued, papered over the fact that Few could admit, though none could deny, that history had entered a phase of blind drift. Both liberalism and the left, both liberal and left intellectuals alike, had abdicated, all in their own, uh, in, each in their own way, and whether in the East or in the West, all professing the end of ideology, despite the manifest and catastrophic persistence of what Marx had termed prehistory. In this context, Mills saluted the formation in Britain of a self-professed new left, while cautioning that if there is to be such a politics, what needs to be analyzed is the structure of institutions, the foundations of policies. Of policies. In this sense, both in its criticisms and its proposals, our work is necessarily structural and so, for us, just now, utopia. An immediate precursor of the Platypus project, Mills identified the task facing the new left as that of stitching time, of mending his moment's fundamental discontinuity with the legacy of bringing theory to bear upon practice to constitute and advance the history project inaugurated by the bourgeois revolutions. Given this discontinuity in, with the left, Mills asked the fateful question, who is it that is getting disgusted with what Marx called all the old crap? Who is it that is thinking 
acting in radical ways, to which he answers all over the world, in the block, outside the block, and in between, the answer is the same, the young intelligentsia. With the left in disarray organizationally and lacking in direction theoretically, the situation was fraught in the extreme. People were discontent living in a contradictory social order, and as Mill recognized, it was impossible to simply rewind the tape of history. The new left had to begin where it stood, and this would, inquire, this would require engaging above all the young. In such circumstances, his advice was sage. Be realistic in your utopianism, adding, read Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg too. Given the clarity with which he recognized the death of the left in, the, in 1960, and his recognition of the task this imposed, it's difficult to say whether his early death was a tragedy or a blessed mercy, since at least Mills was spared witnessing the experience of the new left and its progressive abdication of the task that Mills saw that it faced. Mills knew that only a new generation could rediscover the utopian realism that Marxism alone promised, even though Marxism itself had betrayed it. Mills was not affirming youthfulness, but acknowledging only that young intellectuals could work through the end of ideology and utopia's removal to no place on earth. Mills envisioned no student politics or youth counterculture, but rather the reconstitution of the left by, above all, intellectuals. But by the end of the 1960s, Mills' task was, in some ways, more intractable than it had been in 1960. Rather than a new left, what had emerged was a revolutionary youth movement, one that proved itself to be the very opposite of Mill's young intelligentsia. As Adorno bitterly commented, world history once again produced in parody the kind of people who it in fact needs. In 1969, a decade after C. Wright Mills' famous letter to the New Left, the most significant expression of student politics in America, the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, held what would turn out to be the last of its annual conferences here in the city of Chicago. At the convention, numerous caucuses struggled with one another, but the central fight was between two, progressive labor and the revolutionary youth movement. The latter of these two was composed of two internal factions. One composed of those who would later, one those who would later become known as the Weather Underground, and the other, led by Mike Klonsky, was a splinter from the Communist Party that rejected the 1956 criticism of Stalin, following the line of Mao. These in two internal factions, the Weather Group and the Klonskyites, were known as RIM or Revolutionary Youth Movement One and RIM Two, respectively. In the end. The weather group successfully won out at the convention, first expelling progressive labor and then splitting with RIM II, which in the end proved to have more in common with the workerist Maoist progressive labor rights than they did with their erstwhile allies. But even the weather, weather group had links with the PL. For instance, the main authors of the weather paper, John Jacobs and Jim Mellon, had both been members of it in 1965 and 66 breaking with the party only when it reversed its third worldist line. For them, in 65 and 66, as in 69, the main struggle going on in the world today is between U.S. imperialism and the national liberation struggles against it in considering every other force or phenomenon from Soviet imperialism or Israeli imperialism to workers' struggle in France or Czechoslovakia we determine who are our friends and who are our enemies according to whether they help U.S. imperialism or fight to defeat it, unquote. For, former weatherman Mark Rudd elaborates on, on the conclusions that flowed from this analysis as follows. The weather group argued the following. The United States is rich because of a world empire that channels wealth to this country. The revolt now taking place against the empire, for instance in Vietnam, will cause the overextension of U.S. military forces, 
thus Che's slogan, create two, three, many Vietnams. Internally, the country is undergoing social crisis, including the revolt of the black people that have been an internal colony for hundreds of years. Since black people are already engaging in an armed struggle, whites should support them and share the cost. White workers have privileges from this imperialist system, that is, relative wealth and status above non-white people, and will not oppose the system because of these privileges. However, young people, including young white workers, are experiencing the crisis of this system and are rejecting its control, hence the youth movement. We revolutionaries should be organizing in high schools, in the military, on the street corner, linking up issues and teaching that imperialism is always the issue. Like the Stalinists of progressive labor in Room 2, the weather group discarded Marxism in the name of revolution. The difference is that they did so deliberately. As Rudd notes, their very name implies you don't need weatherman, which comes from the line, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the way the wind blows, which he glosses as you don't need ancient dogmas to understand the reality around you. Commenting on the genesis of such views in the history of SDS, Rudd remarks in an interview in the Platypus Review, we studied the monthly review, John Geraci and David Horowitz's book, Free World Colossus, and the conclusion we drew was that national liberation movements throughout the world and internally within the United States were actually poised to defeat American imperialism. Unquote. Deeply initiated into the cults of Che Guevara and of rock and roll, the weathermen were self-convinced revolutionaries ready to sacrifice themselves for the narcissistic satisfaction of martyrdom. As Rudd says in his interview, we felt we were the heirs to the great tradition of 20th century revolutionary communism and that these battles between Che Guevara's FOCO theory and the primacy of national liberation or between dogmatic Maoism and the primacy of the working class line. We felt that all this stuff was extraordinarily important because it was the culmination of a century-long struggle that would end in the defeat and downfall of U.S. imperialism and of the monopoly capitalism that undergirded it. The weather group believed the battle lines were drawn, and above all, it was a matter of choosing sides. They were determined to out-radicalize Marx. Progressive labor brought a large number of delegates to the 1969 Chicago SDS conference. As a disciplined organization operating within the, the loose organizational framework of SDS, they were able to exert considerably more influence than their numbers alone could warrant. Waving little red books over their heads in imitation of the Cultural Revolution film clips they had seen, they shouted, Mao, Mao, Mao Tse-Tung, dare to struggle, dare to win. To counter their strength, the national office largely sympathetic to the weather group, brought in speakers from the Puerto Rican Young Lords, the Chicago Brown Berets, uh, and, and the Black Panthers to attack those who would challenge the centrality of anti-imperialism, those who say all nationalism is reactionary. It was, uh, as Black Panther Jewel Cook threatened the assembled young, practically all white students, SDS would have to kick out the progressive, would have to kick out progressive labor which denied the right of self-determination to oppressed people or else so cease to be considered revolutionary. Bernadine Dorn echoed this when, when the split finally came and she grabbed the microphone saying, we're going to have to decide whether we can continue to stay in the same organization with people who deny the right of self-determination to be oppressed. Anyone who wants to talk to me about that, follow me into the next room. <laughs> it, was, it was dare to struggle, dare to win, versus power to the people. Though as Chris will discuss at length in his talk tomorrow, the landscape of the contemporary left had not fully taken shape. <coughs> its basic topography was clearly visible here. Mill's project of a new left had given, a le had given way to the new left, abdicating its task in favor Uh, abdicating its task in, in favor of actions. Platypus, as Mills foresaw, 
faces the same question that, that the new left faced. How a young intelligentsia might reread Lenin and Luxembourg in such a way as to rediscover what they might mean and how they might be rendered genuinely meaningless for future generations. Because in its failure, the new left bequeathed this project to Platypus, we are condemned to revisit the history of the 1960s in order not to repeat it. For this reason, the critic of the new, the critic of the new left, Theodore Adorno, is a crucial touchstone for us. As he wrote in 1969, echoing Mills, the relapse into barbarism has already occurred. To expect it in the future, even after Auschwitz and Hiroshima, is to take pitiable consolation in the thought that the worst is possibly yet to come. The sole adequate praxis, the project the New Left abandoned above all through the militancy of the Weather Underground and the retread Stalinism of Rem II and progressive labor, would be to put all energies towards working our way out of barbarism. As it is, authoritarianism has absorbed that which claims to oppose it, and as Adorno put it, allegedly radical praxis renews the old terror. The petit bourgeois truism that fascism and communism are the same is shamefully confirmed. The death of the left means just that. The certainties of the past are of no use to us in Platypus, as in fact the project of working our way out of barbarism, of forging a politics adequate to capitalism's regression, has never in fact been attempted. As Adorno remarked, whoever does not make the transition to irrational and brutal violence, as the weathermen did 40 years ago, sees himself faced forced into the vicinity of reformism that, for its part, shares in the guilt for perpetuating the deplorable totality. But no shortcut helps, and what does help is deeply obscure. person uh, who stands for what I stand for, an activist, the activist, becomes the target or the potential target for somebody who is insecure, terrified, afraid, or very disturbed themselves. Knowing that uh, I could be assassinated at any moment or any time, I feel it's important that some people know my thoughts. I stood for more than just a candidate. I, I have never considered myself a candidate. I have always considered myself part of a movement, part of a candidacy. I wish I had time to explain everything I did. Almost everything was done in the eyes of the gay movement. The title of my presentation is called Spoiled Milk. <laughs> <laughs> How the failures of the past uh, sour the present. <laughs> After its protagonist's assassination, Gus Van Sant's Milk from 2008 ends with a candlelight march on the streets of San Francisco. It is presented as a moment of political cohesion, all the S's standing united against violent homophobia for civil rights. The message is clear. The oppressed must unite against the oppressor. In her latest tract, Sexuality and Socialism, History, Politics, and Theory of LGBT Liberation, International Socialist Organization editor Sherry Wolf, in her 2009 book, has translated this simple message into a book like excursus on the need for unity on the left. Solidarity, she writes, between working class, straight, and LGBT people is no longer a distant dream, but can be forged and strengthened in a period that is throwing up all sorts of questions about the way our society is organized. From economic and racial inequality to the profit-driven exploits of industries that destroy the environment. 
but Wolf, who has also been a leading advocate and spokesperson for the legal recognition of same-sex marriage, has no truck with the so-called postmodern identity politics represented by queer activists, who've accused Marxists like Wolf as propping up marriage as a decaying institution. And the self-styled radical queers have returned the favor. Take, for example, the recent defamation of the Human Rights Campaign Office the same day as the Equality March on Washington last October. As reported by Brian Moylan for Gawker, the vandalizers were none other than queer activists applying their signature tactic, glandalism. In the imagination of the perpetrators, queers are not to blame. Rather, violence is a natural cry of the oppressed. Their target, the Human Rights Campaign, is a national advocacy group for gay marriage. The justification? According to the perpetrating group's official statement, signed by Queers Against Assimilation, just like society today, the HRC is run by a few wealthy elites who are in bed with corporate sponsors who proliferate militarism, heteronormativity, and capitalist exploitation. The address continues. The queer liberation movement has been misrepresented and co-opted by the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign. The HRC marginalizes us into a limited struggle for aspiring homosexual elites to regain the privilege that they've lost and climb the social ladder towards becoming bourgeoisie. Now, we shouldn't let the HRC off the hook, but the problem isn't that they're aspiring homosexual elites. Their problem, <laughs> and by extension the ISOs, is with their politics, with the perpetual, pitiful, and sometimes petulant lobbying of the Democratic Party for piecemeal reform. Now, such pleading may eventually deliver gay marriage, but it won't give us anything more, not least of all along the lines of sexual freedom. Over the past two decades, the so-called mainstream gay agenda has attempted to realize the legal recognition of same-sex marriage through test case litigation sponsored by legal advocacy organizations. But that's about it. With such insipid leadership, the predominant forces in gay politics have generated their own resistance. The field is now split into two camps with two different positions on the marriage question, for and against, despite both sides laying claim to the legitimate aspirations of something called the gay or queer community. Those who insist in favor of same-sex marriage have on their side the most powerful advocacy organizations, such as the Human Rights Campaign, along with the Marxist spokespersons like Sherry Wolf. But most prominently, they have controversial mainstream conservative author Andrew Sullivan. And those who insist against same-sex marriage have a cluster of academics, like Michael Warner and Lauren Berlant, and grassroots activists and nonprofit organizations, a motley crew to say the least. In this convoluted mix, however, one thing is clear. Both sides are united in the embrace of a history of gay liberation that starts in the late 1960s. Flemicists on each side reach casually into historical memory, attempting to find a useful past that might furnish for them the strategies and vocabulary with which to fashion for themselves a radical heritage suited to the liberationist demands of the present. Such appropriation of history possesses a veneer of critical intention. When the history of 1960s era radicalism is investigated, it is a history from below, as ordinary people taking to the streets, as we saw in that clip, to demand their rights and realize their freedom. Likewise today, the populist bent is exposed clearly in queer radicals whose immediate and absolute demands are insisted to represent the legitimate strivings of ordinary people. The question then is one of leadership. A bourgeois demand, same-sex marriage, is opposed by a queer, ostensibly anti-capitalist set of demands, usually including the decriminalization of sex offenders, advocacy for transsexual and intersex people, the expansion of social services for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer and intersex people, and, and so on. But it's precisely such populist accounts of gay liberation that must be challenged for any substantive social transformation and advance in gay liberation, sexual freedom to be effective, much less successful. The question cannot be simply over tactical political goals, uh, but must be rather over an entire conception of capitalism and sexuality. And it's this bigger problem, which is both theoretical and practical, which, was, uh, which is that which was evaded by the historical gay liberation movement itself. Instead, the militant turn in gay politics, hailed by the ISO and other pseudo-radicals as a watershed moment in sexual liberation, has bequeathed decades of agonizing over gay identity leading straight into the present impasse. <laughs> Not surprisingly, the evasions of the past have been incessantly reproduced in the way in which this past has been remembered. Accounts of the gay liberation movement have been written since its inception at the famous Stonewall in riots, yet the political content of the movement has only rarely been analyzed or even critiqued. Partly, this is a result of the nearness of the movement to many of its historians' own lives. 
resulting in retrospective, mostly celebratory accounts concerned to vindicate the movement's contributions to the contemporary world. Such commentators, such as the literal historian George Chauncey, are even modest enough to include cheap television fads like Will and Grace in their accounts. But it could also be said that the historiography on gay liberation has taken its later trajectory for granted. Familiar narratives of the period have given gay politics respectability, comparable to that of the civil rights movement. Hence the general account given by dissidents within contemporary gay politics is that there was a moment for opportunity for something called gay liberation that was besieged by the right. Either conservative organizations like Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority or the depredations of Democratic and Republican Party politics. Ravashi Baid, who worked for many years with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, claims that the result of these pressures was the mainstreaming of gay and lesbian liberation, which for her means desexualizing the movement by channeling resources into ostensibly conservative goals, and the deluded hope that they would be more practically realizable. Sherry Wolf's avowedly Marxist account concurs that the reformist leadership of the movement compelled their defeat in the face of political opposition, but didactically adds that these betrayers were never really Marxist to begin with, and therefore never really interested in the true project of sexual liberation, which Wolf conveniently leaves sorely undeveloped to begin with. Such underst understatements, to say the, say the least, by left-wing commentators all share the sense that the gay movement itself was good, but was sold out by bad forces extrinsic to their interests. The mainstream political parties, the new right, even the bourgeoisie. But they fail to confront or critique the logic underpinning gay liberation, the movement's potential complicity in its own defeat. For all the social movements of the 1960s underwent a similar trajectory of rapid rise and prolonged decay. And all, from blacks to the labor movement, pinned their hopes on Bill Clinton in 1992, <laughs> only to find themselves bitterly disappointed. And suffice it to say, much of the radicalism in the 1960s had been absorbed into the Democratic Party way before then. To better explicate this historical trend in American sexual politics, over the past 50 years then, we must better establish the structural form which social movements took in order to better assess their inner limits and possibilities of the politics uh, that emerged. I wish to suggest, in contrast to the Hallett account memorialized in the recent movie Milk and political tracts like Sherry Wolf's, the participants in the gay liberation movement began to act like Tammany Hall brokers themselves betraying the glimmer of sexual freedom into the banalities of mainstream politics. But this started with radicals, not just the old line assimilationists, and thus radical liberationist rhetoric carried within it the seeds of its own accommodations. Now the time to elaborate this historical point is very brief, uh, so I hope this is an altogether abbreviated account of gay liberation and its broader context within the historical new left. Historians have remembered the 1960s as the crucible within which new social movements emerged, loosely described as the new left, which shaped the landscape of progressive politics through the present. And Tom Hyden's latest account in 2004 in the decade has purportedly established the culture that made Barack Obama's 2008 election possible. The apparent coexistence among pacifist liberals and proponents of revolutionary violence in the same student organizations, such as the Students for Democratic Society and Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, have led to the dual categorization of the good 60s and the bad 60s. A former category includes the authors of the Port Huron Statement, a pain to civic virtue in Republican participatory government, and in the latter category, both the Black Panther Party and the Weathermen. Thus, the popular memory of this era follow, follows an arc, starting with the early civil rights movement of the 1950s and gradually degenerating into the race riots, nights of rage, and the townhouse bombing. But this prevalent narrative poses problems for a critical analysis of how the politics of gay liberation since the inaugural event of this new social movement occurs very late. The Stonewall Riots took place in June 1969. There were gay rights initiatives earlier, of course. The most prominent gay advocacy groups, such as the Manichaean Society, the Daughters of Belitis, One Incorporated, were founded in the 1950s. What characterized the emergence and rap rapid proliferation of gay liberation organizations was not simply its militancy or radicalism per se. The Manichaean Society, whose history was pioneered by John D'Amelio, was founded by communists but rather its adoption of a set of political assumptions grounded in interest group pluralism. Hence, the first decade of gay liberation can be contrasted with the earlier movements by its assertion of a gay community with its putative uh, singular interests and an agenda for self-governance. According to John D'Amelio, the basis of political opposition that sprung into action after Stonewall could not have existed if it were not for the predecessors in the so-called homophile movement, who strove to secure basic civil rights and recognition of gays and lesbians as an unjustly discriminated against minority. 
I want to both amend and extend de Millier's argument to account for the rise of gay liberation by interpreting community as a politically operative category to which the leaders of the movement responded by extending and deepening its character and significance. The activists interpreted the strategy of closed ranks to be effective given their specific historical context and strove to define their movement in the terms of interest group pluralism. Right now, I will suggest that two strategies, gay consciousness and gay power, characterize the gay liberation movement's formation and set the trajectory through the 1970s. What is gay power? The fact that gays asserted themselves along the lines of ethnic pluralism in the mold of Tammany Hall should surprise historians of the movement, not least of all because it represented a break from older arguments for gay equality under, under the law as a civil rights issue, an issue on which the heterosexual majority had long been ignorant. For example, the Council on Religion and the Homosexual, a coalition of Protestant clergy in partnership with the Daughters of Belitis, the Tavern Girl of San Francisco, and the Society for Individual Rights, argued for law reform to decriminalize homosexuality on the grounds that the laws were unenforceable and therefore arbitrary. Their pamphlet, The Challenge and Progress of Homosexual Law Reform, asserts the government should take the lead in educating the public, in addressing valid grievances, and in integrating minority groups into the fabric of society, rather than succumb to prejudice or fall back on the defense that it cannot and should not act because society does not understand homosexuality. This older model was superseded on the grounds that gays themselves needed to educate the public about gay issues. The burgeoning black power movement provided a conscious model for gay power, which borrowed key terms and attempted similar strategies to affect cultural and political change. The two were often fused. Activists in the movement did not have to agree with everything that the black nationalists did to nevertheless adopt their model. For example, activist Jim Owls did not agree with the Gay Liberation Front's endorsement of the Black Panther Party in fall 1969, but he nevertheless participated in the Gay Activist Alliance, where he articulated his own version of gay power. Gay power, he explained in an interview, is where you have a strong pride in your own minority. In blunt terms, it means that no matter which gang is running City Hall or sitting in the White House, they're not going to take any measures against your group. That's how you know you have power. <laughs> The aspirations of gay power were straightforward. <coughs> Win political authority for members of your own group to ensure that your group doesn't get cut out of social or political resources. Gay consciousness. Alongside assertions of gay power were appeals for gay consciousness. One aspect of this development took the form of education to inculcate the proper attitudes and affirmation towards gay life. Frank Kameny was one leader of the gay liberation movement who combined both political and cultural aspirations Kameny, who was fired from his civil service job in 1957 for his homosexuality, invented the slogan, Gay is Good, to serve the same function as Black is Beautiful, to establish in the gay community, quote, the feelings of pride and self-esteem essential to human dignity. Far more significant, however, was the role of the gay press in establishing a group identity that was simultaneously cued to the same issues, problems, and politics. The burgeoning gay press, characterized by popular journals such as One, and the reportage and editorials of The Advocate, was one of the primary vehicles through which gay consciousness gained saliency, as independent networks of journalists and writers connected gay people and spoke of them as a united community. During these formative years, a number of tragic events reported in The Advocate, which was established in 1967, <coughs> created key points of reference for the movement participants, the intent of which was to generate interest and empathy for issues of concern to the newly founded gay community. The most momentous was the police raid on the Stonewall Inn and subsequent riot in 1969, which was reported through its slogans such as Christopher Street for the Queens, and liberate the street. The immediate conditions of street fighting quickly transcended their limited frame, and Stonewall became a symbol of gay oppression everywhere, to be celebrated annually as Gay Pride Day. In the aftermath of the riots, journalists of The Advocate more assertively articulated a new collectivity. After the Sheridan Square revolt of September 1969, for example, journalist Clark and Nichols gave voice to the aspirations of gay power, and noted concerns that outside groups would channel the gay community's energies towards causes which have nothing to do with homosexuals. Concerns of co-optation from forces, uh, forces supposed to be exogenous to the movement does not just characterize recent retrospective accounts. The anxieties produced by the notion of singular group consciousness became particularly intense at this formative moment in the movement's existence. Following the series of riots, the press focused on both catastrophes and causes for cele celebration that exemplified the putative gay community's capacity for agency, thereby communicating to its readers nationwide that the political strategy of gay power was effective and purportedly producing tangible results. 
The Advocate reported in May 1970 that the gay community was galvanized when a young man impaled himself on a fence after jumping or being forced off of a second story of a New York police station. Another major event in 1972 catapulted national gay togetherness after the upstairs bar in New Orleans was targeted by arsonists who killed over 29 patrons. The upstairs holocaust, as it was called, occasioned a national response by the Metropolitan Community Church, which arranged an impromptu ceremony at which gay historian Jim Kepner declared a part of our souls was ignited. Reverend Troy Parker, an icon of gay self-determination, founded the Metro Metropolitan Community Church in 1968 as an ostensibly gay separatist organization. An advocate article from 1972 covered the church's gay marriage ceremonies, which concludes with a quote from the 4th century BC Greek comedy writer Menander, marriage is an evil that most men welcome. Marriage at this time clearly was not seen as contrary to the project of gay liberation but it's one particular expression of self-determination and cultural affirmation. I could go on, but I want to emphasize, <laughs> in particular, the deeply conservative dimensions of gay liberation of thought. There is an aspect of radicalism, to be sure. Some formulations, which I'll consider in turn, were ostensibly related to the revolutionary socialist and third world nationalist movements. But for the most part, participants in the gay liberation movement hopped on board a bandwagon whose basic structural features were characterized by assertions of group consciousness, and group power politics. To briefly follow this account to the present, gay liberation activists worked to constitute a legitimate gay community at a time when it appeared the best way to attain social power and privileges associated with citizenship. But the collapse of the social reforms of the mid-1960s after the crisis of 1973 compelled the gay movement to seek shelter in the Democratic Party, which since the defection of the Dixiecrats in the previous decade appeared susceptible to, uh, to transformation by including minority or marginalized perspectives within the party program. The migration of the gay movement into mainstream politics split activists along the lines of those who sought alliances with political elites and those who sought to build community from without. The outbreak of HIV AIDS caused a further rift in the strategy between these two remnants of gay liberation. After gay organizations pressured the federal government to intervene in the epidemic, those organizations that sought alliances with political elites in both the Republican and Democratic parties turned same-sex marriage into an issue which could continue to ensure their capacity to deliver payoffs to middle and upper class patrons. The queer activists, by contrast, were limited to the academy and the social service sector and no such obligations, and hence became the basis of opposition to same-sex marriage as we know it today. So by way of conclusion, no left, no revolution. No revolution, no sexual freedom. <laughs> there you go. The illusion, the illusion that the struggle for sexual liberation has continued apace despite the left's demise over the past half century is tough to break. All this despite the fact that gay liberation was pushing on an open door, for there's no degree of sexual freedom that capitalism cannot accommodate. But it is nevertheless necessary to consider sexual politics, because the question of sexual freedom sharply, sharply exposes not only the possibility, but also the necessity of politically overcoming capitalism. And it does so in a way that opens up our conception of capitalism and socialist politics, helping us to understand how politics might be concerned with freedom, rather than what, I've concerned here, than what I've called here interest group pluralism, becoming rather than identity. The hallmark of gay liberationist militancy was its explicit condemnation of the so-called bourgeois nuclear family, giving rise to the slogan to abolish the family. According to the theory of the day, taken up by Sherry Wolf of the ISO as if it were new, capitalist production requires, above all, the reproduction of the working class. This reproductive imperative, as it were, shapes sexuality by channeling it into sexual norms and gender roles. Hence it would seem that abolishing the family would be tantamount to overcoming capitalism. In as early as 1966, a British socialist and psychoanalyst named Ju Juliet Mitchell leveled a strident critique of such pseudo-radicalism by pointing out its flippant reduction of sexual oppression into the categor categorical imperative to overthrow the family. The matter of sexual oppression is more complicated, Mitchell argued, because it is held together by multiple strands of social development, in particular the mode of production, reproduction, sexuality, and the socialization of children. One could advance on a single front, socialized production, divorce sex from reproduction with contraceptive and birth control technologies, or provide the limited access to schooling and child support, but advancing on one would not guarantee an advance on any other. What Mitchell recognized was that sexual liberationists were proceeding without any theory of capitalism that could grasp what Marx called contradiction, namely the ways in which capitalist development opens up determinate possibilities 
that are systematically closed off by reactionary political formations. To use a simple if blunt, exa if blunt example, capitalist technology has generated the capacity to free individuals from the burden of undesired children, but reactionary politicians block all attempts to provide social support so that access to, access to these technologies is, is uh, uh, not freely accessible to everyone. Far from impeding sexual freedom, capitalism is driving it, at least potentially. This is what makes Mitchell's account compelling, that she views socialism as the completion of freedoms rendered possible but politically unobtainable under capitalism. She accused her comrades on the left, who simply declared all family life to be counter-revolutionary, to be, in her words, in the worst sense, unhistorical. Radical sins, and indeed all militant liberationists, have not heeded Mitchell's call to formulate and realize strategic objectives to achieve sexual freedom. In Mitchell's day, there was still, in some for form or another, socialist movements whose members could be inspired and led. Now there is nothing, and we are faced less with advocating for socialism than with the mere, more basic task of explicating an understanding of capitalism from an emancipatory point of view. This is necessary because the recrudescence of identity politics and queer theory in the contemporary gay movement, even the likes of the ISO, has itself become an obstacle to sexual freedom. For any attempt to construe gay politics in terms of minority rights, elides the epochal significance of the movement's demands. As historian John D'Amelio pointed out in his seminal essay, Capitalism and Gay Identity, the possibility of sexuality is concomitant with the existence of wage laborers. Traditional society is swept away by the onslaught of capitalist development, tearing men and women away from their towns and drawing them to cities, where they can fashion sexual lives and communities for themselves. Sexuality and the rise of homophobia is a problem distinct to the era of the working class. For as D'Amelio observes, the insecurities experienced within capitalist society generate political reactionaries who misplace their discontent onto gays as scapegoats. It is not simply a matter of working class unity, as nostalgically played in milk, but working class politics. D'Amelio's account of homophobia provides a useful corrective to the liberationist rhetoric of us versus them, which pitted a nascent gay community against the mainstream society, which was assumed to hold bad attitudes, which, or so the theory went, caused sexual oppression. Framing this as a question of group oppression and group identity, as I, su as I suggested earlier, led straight into political accommodationism. But this lopsided interpretation of social reality, as advanced by the militants of the new left, sounded radical when they denounced their comrades in Marxist political organizations as being unable to get over their bigotries. Now, there is certainly political opportunism on the frayed elements of the left, and nearly all significant left-wing organizations, with the exception of the newly formed Spartacus League, deferred judgment on gay liberation until the 1970s or 1980s. But the skepticism with which gay liberationists met the Marxist left was ill-founded. The problem was never just bad attitudes. It was the left's degeneration into Stalinism, which went hand in hand with the death of the socialist movement's emancipatory aims. And yet, the gay liberation mil uh, liber liberationist militants of the 1960s failed to critically assess this problematic legacy. Consequently, they did not supersede, but instead fell back upon old formulations derived from third world liberation and demanded the abolition of the family as a straightforward negation of the right-wing socialist and the later Stalinist emphasis on preserving the integrity of the proletarian family. What Juliet Mitchell recognized in 1966 was that if the inadequacies of the Marxist left were, be, were to be criticized from an emancipatory point of view, it must be criticized from within the history of the left. Mitchell claimed that the socialists of the Second International, like August Babel and Vladimir Lenin, sorely neglected to treat the specific features of modern society that must be transformed to achieve sexual freedom, instead assuming that socialism would equal women's emancipation. This is not to say, of course, that they neglected this issue. Unlike many other social democratic politicians, Babel and Lenin devoted a great deal of their political work to agitate for sexual equality. It's no accident that the Bolshevik Revolution was a world historical event that granted women suffrage, legalized abortion, and decriminalized homosexuality in more or less one fell swoop. But Mitchell's reinvestigation of this problem spurred her return to the earlier revolutionary writings of Karl Marx from the Revolutionary Ferment of 1848. The inadequacies of second international socialism did not go away but were being reproduced in the nascent feminist theory. Mitchell criticizes the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir in this respect. The militant turn in sexual liberation was repeating all the failures of the left to address sexual freedom, while proponents of liberation unreflectively drove their politics to their logical endpoint in accommodation and self-liquidation. <laughs>
The death of the left in 1960s militancy was a peculiar phenomenon, and gay liberation cannot be understood except in this context. As an entire movement self-destructs, no intellectual or political actor can escape the clutch of regression. Vocabulary shrivels as concepts and the words to which they refer disappear. Political discourse coarsens and petrifies, and analysis transforms into a set line. The understanding loses itself in surface phenomena. Activity generates, uh, degenerates into theater. The gay liberation movement recognized this problem in its own way by attempting to elaborate a theory of liberation that was historically novel, to help alleviate the moralistic death grip of Cold War liberalism. But gay liberation as a political movement failed to raise historical consciousness, or what amounts to the same thing, to raise the contradiction of freedom and domination under capitalism to the level of practical knowledge. In other words, to raise historical consciousness would have required the advance of an international socialist movement poised to make the revolutionary transformations necessary to achieve sexual freedom. But it was precisely this task that liberationist rhetoric evaded under its cloak of group consciousness and group power. And it is precisely this task that any future left to take up the call for sexual freedom, not as an identity politics, but as an emancipatory politics, to fulfill the highest promises of modern capitalist society, to achieve fulfillment and establish the material grounds for happiness. Far from prescribing the future, the left must push in the limits of possibility under capitalism without once reneging our responsibility to establish the necessity of political revolution. For all his other faults, Friedrich Engels got the basic idea right in his description of people in a free society. Once such people appear, he wrote, they will not care a rap about what we today think they should do. They will establish their own practice and their own public opinion, comfortable therewith, on the practice of each individual. And that's the end of it. It's up to the left to abolish punitive morality and establish the grounds for human sexuality to flourish. To the proponents of queer theory and gay domesticity, the two poles of sexual death in today's barbarism, <laughs> the left must respond as Trotsky wrote of the Fourth International against Stalinist counter-reaction in its day. Then it must sweep away the quacks, charlatans, and unsolicited teachers of morals. In a society based upon exploitation, the highest moral is that of social revolution. Thank you. <laughs> So, in large part, this talk is a kind of revisiting of these events and sort of chopping them up uh, for consideration. And, um, and the other is a kind of reflection of what the Black Panther Party stood for, and in hopes to not not simply sort of dismiss this moment, but seeing it as symptomatic of a kind of problem that I think both Spencer and Greg have been talking about. So, uh, I hope that I can uh, reiterate some points that have been made through this different historical case. Um, the Black Panther Party uh, was founded in 1966 in Oakland, in California, by two people, uh, Hugh P. Newton and Bobby Seale. At the beginning, it was titled the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and it did basically what it name said. its name said. It uh, defended people in black neighborhoods in Oakland against police brutality. So what they would do is they would you know, send armed troops in these neighborhoods in order to defend people against you know, the, the violent um, acts of the police in Oakland. Um, it gained popularity during 1967 when Huey P. Newton um, shot and killed a cop and was later incarcerated in 1968. At this moment, and this is critical to understanding the history of the Black Panther Party, uh, Huey P. Newton was incarcerated and Eldridge Cleaver took uh, leadership of the organization and the organization really had its militant um, stages in the moments of 1968 and 1969 when Huey was still in prison. Um, there was a Free Huey campaign that was organized by Bobby Seale and this was able to instrumentalize political support such as SNCC and um, the uh, Peace and Freedom Party. 
um, which was a very fruitful relationship for the organization. Um, so to a large extent, after 1970, which is when uh, Huey was freed, he inherits an organization that is already uh, sort of ongoing and already has particular direction. And what's interesting about the year of 1970 is that he starts to reflect about the problems of political practice and theory that the organization inherits. Um, and I think that for my purposes, I think that Newton is a more interesting character than Eldridge Cleaver because in fact he was, you know, he was, he was more of a visionary. He, he thought through the problems of political practice in this moment and, and articulated that he, his organization um, hit a wall when it came to uh, political activity. So, in 1970, um, there was a speech that uh, Hugh Newton uh, um, delivered at Boston College in front of an audience of about 1,200 people, in which he reflected on the history of Marxism and on 1917 and what it meant to be, as it was self-conceived, a Marxist-Leninist organization. Um, he introduced categories such as the lumpen proletariat, and talked about uh, third world revolutions and the centrality of these revolutions, the work of the Black Panther Party. Um, so I want to take a close look at this particular period because, like I said, this is the moment in which Hugh P. Newton is free from jail. This is the moment in which the organization goes through an existential problem as to its political practice and its thought. And I think that it's a very productive um, juncture in its history that is, I think, often overlooked. Um, so in 1970, uh, in Boston College, uh, Hugh Pinion is thinking about the legacy of Marxism and the ways in which it uh, attempts to challenge and overcome uh, capitalism. And I think that here you glean um, the way in which the Black Panther Party politics not only were sort of ensconced in the sort of, um, movement-ism uh, of the student politics and, and the, these kinds of uh, um, more um, radical absurgence and this new, this new wave, but they themselves were trying to make sense of this post-industrial period and the period of an increased technocracy. So, so that Huey P. Newton, for example, says, well, you know, there's this, um, the workers have basically been bought out, there's a bureaucratization of workers, there's a failure of, of workers' movements, and so the lumpen proletariat is, takes a, a more um, central role in the development of uh, a revolutionary subject. To a certain extent, he's reiterating some, something that he's inherited, which is a kind of Maoist framework of envisioning a revolution, and he's just representing and re-articulating in this speech the, necess the necessity of concentrating on those who have been cast off from society at this moment, such as the lumpen proletariat. Um, but the second point that he makes when he thinks about the history of the left and the history of Marxism is about the overcoming of labor time. And this is what I thought, and I found it to be peculiar, uh, because we don't often think of Newton as a sophisticated thinker, and yet there is this, this, this attempt to articulate the overcoming of labor time as part of the project of Marxism. And so I wanted to read a quote from this speech. He says, Lenin's whole theory, after he put Marx's analysis into practice, was geared to get rid of the proletariat. In other words, when the proletariat class of the working class seized the means of production, they would plan their society in such a way to be free from toil. As a matter of fact, Lenin saw a time in which man could stand in one place, push buttons, and move mountains. It sounds to me as though he saw a proletariat working class transformed and in possession of a free block of time to indulge in productive creativity, to think about developing their universe so that they could have the happiness, the freedom, and the pleasure that all men seek and value. Um, later in the same speech, he emphasizes distributive justice and representational politics. So there's a question as to how much Huey P. Newton understands his own reflections um, as to you know, the history of Marxism and the goals of a Marxist movement. Because later on, the Black Panther Party, after the split of Eldridge Cleaver and Hugh Newton, after the 1971 moment, becomes a largely reformist organization, meaning they become ensconced in sort of democratic party politics in which they are um, developing relationships to uh, local representatives in order to um, help them help them get uh, 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 help them be put into power, 
and including um, Bobby Seale, who was, um, who, should, I should backtrack, in, in 1973 there was a campaign um, for Bobby Seale in order for him to become mayor of Oakland, and the Black Panther Party at this point had put down their weapons and was in support of Bobby Seale, and Bobby Seale got 40% of, of the vote. By this time, the, the organization had ceased to be a sort of quote-unquote militant. Um, this militant period, however, earlier in the organization, as I have laid out, in which Eldridge Cleaver is in charge of the direction of the organization in 1968 and 1969, is worth taking a look, I think, because um, it's either underplayed by historians or we inherit a very romantic view of the kind of practice that the Black Panther Party um, was part of. And so, in 1967, for example, which is what sticks out in my mind, um, there was a, a gun battle which was actually very popular on a uh, very popular practice by the Black Panther Party in which Bobby Hutton, the youngest member of their uh, of the organization was shot and killed by a police officer and shot ten times. Um, later on, Eldridge Cleaver confesses that the gun battle was actually, it, it ensued as a result of a provocation that he'd made uh, against a police officer. And this is the way in which the Black Panther Party really conceived of its politics in this period of 1968-1969, meaning there were the politics of, of power struggle, meaning Eldridge Cleaver not only sort of uh, dealt with the police this way, but he dealt with other political organizations in this manner. Um, now, the service programs that come to play a pivotal role, and those are the ones that I think people remember as far as the history of the Black Panther Party, which are like free breakfast programs and sickle cell anemia, free testing. Um, these programs in large part were a way of gaining the trust from, of the community again. The free breakfast programs were um, they started the same month in which three Black Panther Party members had been killed as a result of another gun battle, and that hundreds of members had left the organization. So it's actually a way of sort of making peace with the community, so to speak, because people had become disenchanted with what the Black Party um, was, was capable of doing. So what happened then? Did, did other people, the, the liberals in, in, in the United States, see this as a problem? Well, in fact, they did, and it's very curious. Um, the funds that, that would help run the organization were given by white liberal America at the time, including uh, uh, there was there's a story of Leonard Bernstein, the conductor in New York, throwing a fundraising party for the Black Panther Party, and it being uh, you know in one of the the cover of those, one of the sections of the New York Times. Um, there's also the New York Times saying that uh, Eldridge Cleaver is an effective and brilliant leader. Um, this is, a, again, at the same time in which these gun battles are ensuing. And there are people literally downplaying the fact that you know, people are being killed in, in gun battles, and that's actually the same for political activity. I found a quote from um, Bob Bonner, who's a sociologist who testified um, in the Hugh P. Newton case, and remember in 1967, Hugh P. Newton killed a police officer, and so he went to court. Um, so this, this sociologist, um, he's reflecting on what his role was in testifying uh, for Hugh P. Newton. So he, he was testifying that this person was a good character. And a quarter of a century later, he was you know, thinking about what role he played in the development of this movement, and it parallels, I think, um, something that some of us in Platypus are familiar with, which is sort of Adorno's insights into the student movement and um, this black nationalist turn. So let me do In retrospect, I and others did not take the militarism of the party seriously enough, believing that the rifles, uniforms, and drilling were largely symbolic. People like me did not want to believe that such a militaristic methodology might indeed have fascistic implications. The rationale that we didn't know what was happening is lame. The excuse has been heard before. The truth is that we didn't want to know. Um, and I think you know this, again, sort of parallel correspondence between Marcuse and Adorno, in which Adorno is pointing out that there are these authoritarian impulses that are being uh, sort of rehearsed in this period of the student left, are being rehearsed in such a politics as black nationalism. And you know, to 
to have a response by someone like Marcuse that it's the available political practice at the time that you know counters the established order. Um, and I think that I want to to raise Newton here as as a problematic or, or, as, or rather as a kind of a figure that didn't quite conceive of his own practice that way. Um, that he saw that there were um, there was political action that was blocked for him, and he was trying to make sense of this this block. Um, so I think I will actually end my, my talk with um, a quote from Newton in this moment of 1970 in which the organization is going through this crisis, in which he hones in on the fact of the kind of impoverishment of uh, utopian thinking and political ideas. Um, so I'll leave you with this. It says, history shows that most of the parties that have led people out of their difficulties have had leaders with what we sometimes call the traits of the bourgeoisie or declassed intellectuals. They are the people who have gone through the established institutions, rejected them, and then applied their skills to the community. In our party, we are not so blessed. History does not repeat itself. It goes on also transforming itself. We see that the leaders in our party are victims. They have not received bourgeois training. So I will not apologize for our mistakes, our lack of scientific approach to use and put into practice, it was a matter of not knowing, of learning, but also of starting out with a loss, a disadvantage that history has seldom seen. That is a group attempting to influence and change, and change society so much while its own leaders were as much in the dark, much of the time, as the people that they were trying to change. And in the spirit of something that was said at the last conference last year, um, I think that actually this was said by Chris in the Platypus Synthesis talk, as far as you know, what would the past think of, of the present? You know, I would like to raise this new, new I guess, uh, interpretation of Hugh Pinion as is dealing with this political conflict, and what opportunities would he think that we have that he didn't, and the way in which he would have used them. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, so we'll open up to some questions. Um, I have my own, but I see hands coming up already in the audience, so we'll just start, I guess, with Ian, and then I think maybe Brian, could you have a hand? I guess my initial reaction to this is that there's something problematic in the periodization that's going on about dealing with the 70s and the late 60s, and there's a couple sort of keystone events that have to be put in the mix that when you're dealing with, like, the new left, fundamentally, is, is not an organization. The old left was an organization. It was, like, it was the Communist Party. And the new left is all these different, bizarre phenomenons and ways of dealing with the reactions to this old, much larger group that was organized, that was, like, a solid thing to talk about. Um, and I think that you get in trouble dealing with all, the, all this late 70s stuff without maybe laying more emphasis on people's reactions to sort of the end of Stalinism and Stalin himself. Because, and this is where I think C.R. Mills is, is, is interesting, because, you know, black power and all that kind of stuff, it's all, and all, all of this is sort of, how do you, like in America, how do you deal with a couple of different events? How do you deal with the fact that after you know, Stalinism is cracking up. It forces all the labor unions to take um, a very conservative stance because Stalin and the Soviet Union all um, supports the Mar well, is against the Marshall Plan. There's, there's all sorts of complicated politics with this. So you have this identification with you know the major the you know, constituency, the labor unions as being conservative somehow. Um, and then you have the civil rights movement. Again, it's this phenomenon that happens after communism in America kind of breaks up and they, they lose their grip on the black question. So then the black question is sort of solved in this different way through a movement. There's no, you know, it's like this different thing. It's not an organization, it's a movement. This is this weird thing that people don't know how to deal with in the new left. They, they all want to have these movements. Um, and I think you get in trouble dealing with the later history because What's basically none of these groups have a good or sophisticated way to deal with the Communist Party breaking up internationally and how that affects America domestically 
you know, can you, for example, just deal with it in some kind of generational way? Like, will they just die out, so we'll just deal with the youth? Or, um, you know, it's not a coincidence that SDS is all Maoists, you know, because it's all people who, you know, are dealing with the fact that, you know, the Communist Party in America can't be supported, their parents or something were part of the Communist Party. Um, and, you know, they all have these crazy ideas about, you know, we can't do that. Um, but they don't really have a sophisticated or useful way of dealing with that problem. They don't have a way of dealing with the fact that, you know, the early, what happens in the early Cold War. So I think, I guess I would hope there's some kind of way to maybe lay some emphasis on why no one had a good way of dealing with the crack up of this single thing, really, the old left, the Communist Party. Um, you know, there's one attempt that we emphasize of intersecting the Communist Party Trotskyism as a failure. That was like a concerted effort to intersect one constituency, the old left, the Communist Party. And, you know, basically everybody in the 60s had, has all these wacky ideas about new constituencies, which they use the term movement to describe because um, they're also dealing with the fact that the civil rights movement is not like a viable project in a lot of ways. Um, so I don't know, that's sort of scattered thoughts, but I was hoping you can reflect on this because I think that by getting into the nitty gritties of the 70s history and all these groups, they're not that revealing in their critiques of society and in their ways of organizing because they really just centrally do not get themselves involved in an interesting way in the crack up of the old left. Um, so that's something I'm going to Yeah, anyone yeah, a um, couple things. I think that Ian makes a good point. I mean, the deep history of this stuff is basically what's the context in which this, this plays out. And the limited scope of political possibilities is already a given for somebody like Newton. Um, so, you know, for example, one of the, the kind of um, the ideological roots of the Black Panther Party was Maoism and Malcolm X. Right? So Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965, the organization was founded in 1966, is central to the development of this, this organization. And to a certain extent, Newton just takes things for granted. You know, he takes for granted that the workers' movement is defunct. He takes for granted that this revolutionary subject is not going to come from organized labor. And you know, he sees the third world liberation struggles as a way of presenting a new potential revolutionary subject. And so, you know, I would agree with the fact that, you know, it, he dealt with the problem of transformation of society in a less interesting way, in a less fruitful way. Um, and so I wouldn't want to sort of underscore, underscore that. I mean, um, I think that one of the most interesting or one of the most crucial uh, ways in which the Black Pan Panther Party is able to grow and gain popularity is because they are a response to the failure of the civil rights movement. And so you know, they very much, in their own rhetoric and their own speeches, speak against the inability of an organization like SNCC and NAACP to really make good on the kind of political possibilities that they thought these movements or these organizations, rather, um, would, would take up. And so that, that's certainly worth um, underscoring. And I guess the reason why I sort of presented Newton as an interesting figure is because I think that this history is not talked about. I mean, I think that you know, the, his inability to conceive of a political practice, his confusion, and the way in which he experiences sort of hopelessness, I think is fruitful for us um, because it's not often sort of dealt with it in this way, right? It's just like militancy, et cetera. I think the issue that, that you identified is um, central to an understanding of the political context of, of this moment. Absolutely central, uh, uh, but I but I can't help but wonder if if asking of the radicals of this period, well, what could they have done that would have actually been effective at establishing the left? Um, that would have been um, effective at, at replacing uh, the old left, which, as you said, had a, a solid institutional anchor worldwide. Uh, if not in the Communist parties, at least in the socialist and the social democratic parties worldwide. And, and the New Left uh, came nowhere near to achieving that. But historically, uh, the fact is that they did fail. And I think that if we're going to learn something from them, we must try to understand these New Left social movements 
as something like a highly successful set of symptoms, re kinds of response formations to the very trauma of living in a world without a left. Broken, inadequate ways of, of trying to deal with the problem that you've identified, but ways that have unfortunately been repeated um, ad nauseum, basically since the time at, at, at which they were uh, devised. Such that in many ways our own moment is, is many aspects of it are, are living through a very um, visceral repetition of, of these new left uh, formations, such that hope that by working through these symptoms and trying to show the, uh, uh, the contradiction and, and incompleted character of, of any one of them, we can at least help prepare the way for thinking about uh, what a left uh, may yet be. Now that's a different kind of question than, you know, practically, well, you know, what do we do now to, you know, reconstitute the left? Um, an immediate practical question. Um, and of course, you know, if, if that's the question that we take uh, uh, ourselves to answer, then we're going to need to look at the exigencies of what types of tactics uh, did these groups attempt and, and why did they not work out? Uh, but I think that our, our project is principally um, trying to working through the, uh, uh, the ways in which the new lab dealt with the problem of well, the left is dead. What do we do now? I mean, what I was trying to zero in on uh, with, with C. Wright Mills is the way in which uh, his, I, I think in some sense, of the, the central category uh, to the notion of constituencies constituency politics in the 60s, his new constituencies, the question of revolutionary agents and the like, um, that I, I think even across uh, a lot of our, a, a lot of the divides that we think about uh, operates as youth, um, and, which is why we look at it coming out of, uh, you know, even, even the Black Panthers are coming out of the uh, student movement, uh, there's a cult of usefulness and, and of sexuality. And um, what I was trying to point out is that uh, for C. Wright Mills, it's not what it's being translated into uh, in the New Left. Um, but it's rather a situation, it's a recognition much, as I think the you know, Platypus has, practically speaking, uh, which is that um, if there's going to if the critical task is going to be addressed, it's most likely going to be done by a new generation. Um, and that, or at least that's what he's looking to. And I don't think that it's a problem that the old left faced. I think it's a symptom of the death of the left um, that he sees. I mean, he, he's pitching his argument uh, in the piece that I address uh, towards the right, and I think that that um, slightly diminishes the force of it when he talks about the individuality, but I think it's clear that, his, uh, that, that he intends to say something about uh, the, the entire epochal condition. And what he's isolating is a question of the breakdown of theory. Um, he's isolating an intellectual question. And so I do think that that is addressing the failure of the left at the level that you're talking about. It doesn't mean that that's adequate to reconstituting the left in the manner of the old or the like. Uh, but the, the fundamental question that would have to be involved in terms of reconstituting a, a politics that actually had transformative potential in the way that we think of uh, the party political left of, of, the, of, of the first half of the 20th century, nearly decades of the 20th century, the key impasse is the question of, of working through the history um, and thinking through capitalism. And I think that that's what he means when he speaks of the tasks of the young intelligentsia, or when Adorno says that world history is produced the kind that produced a parody of the kind of people that we have. Um, and, and so I, I do think that, that Mills is thinking at that level. Um, and, and that was really the level that I was trying to have. So the, 
the weatherman has become a kind of particular and gratuitous gross instance of the, the way in which uh, this collapses into actionism. But in some ways, by you know, by kind of exemplifying the countercultural character of the left, I mean, I think that that's one of the important things about the weatherman um, that the you know the the, the, the rock and roll and the and, and the, uh, the sexual promiscuity and you know, sexual so forth and so on. They were those people, right? Um, that's why they won at, SD, at the convention in 69, because they were the charismatic ones. Um, they were the ones who, at some, at some point, embodied all of the defeats accumulating up to that point. Um, and, 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 and so I, I think that, you know, at some level, when you read Dorno, um, you know, it just is, it's, it's like he has this in mind uh, in a way that's just extremely, because he, I mean, there's all, there are obviously the retreads of Stalinism and so forth that are also in the, in the 69th conference. And, and, and I don't mean the 69th conference to stand in for the whole new left. Uh, but uh, to, just to use it uh, as, as my example. But I think that this kind of really, uh, you know, the, the, the translation of the question of the need for a rethinking on the part of those who are not already reconciled to the death of the left, right? This question of the youth intelligence, yeah, the translation of that into the cult of youth um, by the end of the decade, I think that they do exactly. All right, I'm going to take Ryan's question next and just kind of ask, maybe we'll keep their comments a little bit shorter so we have time to get to a few more questions before we wrap up this evening. Sure, Ryan should take the long because it's just addressed to Pam. Um, Pam, I appreciate the attempt to kind of reinterrogate, you know, the Panthers and Huey Newton and maybe take them more seriously than even a lot of the people who really celebrate them. But I think with respect, you know, we're still too kind. And that, you know, like, I know you only have so much time, but the criminality is left out. And really the thing, and I'll, I'll elicit some groans for this, but the, just the misogyny, this is so pervasive of the Black Panther Party. I think it's Aldrich Cleaver who, you know, Aldrich Cleaver, what, what, what position is there for women in the party? And he said, pro. So it's just, even this seems to be giving too much respectability to these thoughts. But. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not, you know, I think that defending the, as Spencer, I think, put it when he was quoting Adorno, the kind of irrational violence that does you know, pervade in the party, and, and Eldridge Cleaver, which does happen to be a particular character in the party. I mean, Huey P. Newton also, I mean, Huey P. Newton, he, uh, in 1974, he killed the prostitute and he fled to Cuba. He was like in Scotland, like he had an insane drug habit, and this is the time in which like the the party had really just become a bunch of thugs who jump drunk dealer drug dealers and to get a piece of the pie to get their profits and to like steal drugs from them. I mean like the, there's the wretched history, you know, and so like you know there's there's the killings that happened, you know, as a result of these gun battles that that, that were orchestrated, and so that exists. Um, so I, I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sort of apologizing for the Black Panther Party. I think again, like Greg put it, I guess the object of study and sort of looking at this history is the ways in which they dealt with the absence of an emancipatory politics and the way in which they conceived of this obstacle and the way in which, for me, Newton sort of saw it as a problem and the way in which he thought he was getting over that hump, you know, which for him was the reformist route, like, you know, representational justice, distributive justice, and, you know, led nowhere. It led to a lot of disillusionment, and then, you know, led to his, his whatever, drug habit, hooker habit. But, um, you know, so, I don't know, does, does that address the question? I mean, I'm not downplaying this yeah. history. I am not trying to. In fairness, Pam gave me a kind of preview of the presentation which she was enumerating a lot of the, the kind of just you know vulgar violence of the history. That and you told her to her. take it out. I, so I told her. I told her you know, <laughs> what she said. That the question is, what is the it's object not, of inquiry? Yeah, the, the object of inquiry is not you know yeah, the wretchedness of the book. Because certainly, that that's, I can give you the names of like numerous books that like go on. I mean, it's that that actually makes them perhaps forgettable. Yeah. Right. right. No. Uh, more. Just like all the violence that occurs in daily life is basically gotten. But, um, yeah, there's a couple of questions. I think Omer had a question 
still want to answer? No. Just, okay. Um, and Ben and Pablo, I think I might call Spencer, myself. Uh, you begin your talk by enumerating uh, C. Wright Mills call for young people to become responsible intellectuals, and you end it with bombings with uh, partisan takeovers and formationists. I wonder if you could talk about the process of disavowal, the category of being told. Like, the, the disavowal that young people uh, went through over the course of this period, especially uh, as they considered themselves and then didn't consider themselves as intellectuals. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because I think. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe I can, sorry, I'm a little unclear about it. The equivalent of it is why didn't his uh, call for like the creation of an intelligent intent of a you know, body of responsible young intellectuals, what stood in the way of that? I mean, in a sense, I'm. I'm trying to get away from the question that the new left has a, that it sort of had to emerge then, uh, or that it faced definite constraints, um, or something like that. I mean, I think that the new left is kind of always happening after uh, the Second World War. Um, I, I think that it's, it, it's that there's there are deep roots. Uh, it's there in the 50s, impulses are there in the 50s. Um, certainly, I think most, most people that look at it in Britain would look at it. Uh, it. It has so many different genealogies, and I don't think there's any way to ultimately privilege one over the other. Um, because it's really a task um, that just, I mean, what I was trying to emphasize is that the that it, that it's a question. You know, I, for instance, I don't think that it's absolutely clear that you know, the planet was ought to have arisen at a particular point in time, um, you know, or that it, that it could have arisen after after 9/11 in the context of the anti-war movement. Um, I think, in many ways, it was way overdue. Um, in the sense, what I'm saying is that the project that we had is just a project. Um, that it's, there's not exactly, you know, I'm trying to get away from the, well, there was, you know, capitalism was restructuring itself in this way, and it produced these constraints, but these are the things that had to be thought through and so forth, because um, I'm not sure that, um, I mean, in a way, I guess that there's no reason why it, the question, the, the, we, we even think that this task Posed itself, except for the like little messages in the bottle, like C. Wright Mills's letter, uh, you know, like a handful of other intellectuals that make us think that that it wasn't just you know the crazy Mark Rudds and the Plotskys and the this and that, which wouldn't be a history worth re revisiting at all. Um, and and so I, I guess the the way in which I was trying to put it. Uh, was that this is just um, this is just the sore that that won't heal? Um, I'll take Pablo's question and then. No, I wanted to make a comment, which is I, I generally agree that we have to analyze these moments in the context of the decomposition of the left. Uh, what I what I do think, however, is that that. Uh, uh, there's the risk of homogenizing and creating the idea that they're all the same. And I think, for instance, that in that sense, you can't uh, reduce the gay and lesbian movement to a whole thing that's the same since the beginning to the end. Early 1950s, it's, it's clearly not even considering itself as a part of the left. And, and when, when, you know, when the um, liberation movement emerges in the 1970s, I think there's an incapacity to develop a new uh, political pro platform that uh, creates and that, that f uh, fights for a different kind of society, and that's totally true. But I think you're simplifying in, in a way the, uh, the characteristics because there's a lot of people that are against identity politics within the, the liberation movement. Identity politics is basically something that emerges in the 1990s, and uh, I, I think in that sense there's like. Much more complex history than 
than, than, than probably everything as I had to call it from land to fifties to the Um And also there's a difference in the sense, for instance, that the, the kind of actionism that you would see and, and vindication of violence that you would see in the other two movements that you described, you can't see that really in the gay and lesbian movement. There isn't a, uh, like a, a vindication of violence in, in that sense. I mean, uh, Stonewall happens and then they vindicate it, but it's not something they organized. And they never organized something like that again. It just happened and it galvanized the creation of the movement. They were unable to create it, no target, but they don't vindicate violence as, as, as a political tool, for instance. So I think there are like some differences that are worth exploring. Well, my presentation, I mean, I made mean, this something that was very brief, but even in, in my brief presentation, I uh, tried to make clear that there wasn't uh, a difference uh, between the early homophile movement, which was much more aligned to type civil rights organizations. Uh, civil rights organizations, of course, did not consider themselves on the left either. They considered themselves, you know, just civil rights organizations, you know, trying to, you know, pass civil rights legislation that was passed in the 1880s. Um, nothing particularly bold uh, or radical. It's been trying uh, very hard for a very long time to get it, get it done. And there definitely was a shift to uh, militant liberationist uh, rhetoric around the same time in the of, of black power. Um, and in fact, there were uh, uh, appropriations of, of method and, and conception of, of strategy. They may not have glorified violence per se like certain other black power organizations, but not all black power organizations glorify violence to begin with. I mean, I, I tried to set up a, a sufficiently uh, broad typology along the lines of gay power and gay consciousness, which I think is analogous to conceptions of power politics and uh, group identity, uh, the formation that, that I, I, I see analogous in, in the case of, of the black power movement, uh, which, I'm, uh, uh, which I'm familiar with. So that's why I'm trying to make sense of this history uh, by locating parallels. I don't want to collapse one into the other. Uh, that's why I, I try my best to, uh, to draw on primary sources from uh, uh, people in the gay liberation movement itself as, as they were articulating their own vision. Um, and simply is the case that they were in contact uh, with black power, they were inspired by it, and they consciously appropriated a lot from it. It has to do with the nature of the fact that, they're, that, they're move, that the liberal, liberationist movement really got going in 1969. But that's a portion only of the movement. Sure, it's, it's a portion of it. I mean, in a way, I would say that the weather men are are into glamboism, right? I mean, they're not, uh, they're not into, uh, they don't even kill anybody except themselves. Uh, you know, the, uh, well, I mean, they don't. They, 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 they don't they, it takes a few deaths to perfect the bombing table, I guess. Um, but, you know, they're, they're very careful and they make sure that no one's in the building. Announce it ahead of time, and they call it into the. You know, but they, they just hide the bombs so well that even though they've given advanced warning, they, they're never found before they go off. Uh, and of course, nobody wants to stay around at the last minute. Um, and, and so it, it really is this kind of politics of, of performative, you know, this like theater um, from the beginning. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a moment. I mean, supposedly the bomb that killed. Them, in New York City, townhouse. the townhouse bombing was supposedly intended as a, a, as a genuine terrorist act, where they could kill uh, uh, officers that had been, been falling deaths, um, and that this was viewed, of course, in this highly moralized way, as that, you know that maybe this was you know, the bad karma that he got killed by this. Um, they call it this way. Um, so, so I, I, I think that a lot of you know, and, and, uh, you know, certainly the, there are the street battles and so forth. But the Black Panthers were a huge media event. Uh, the, uh, the, the chanting of "Off the Pig" on on live, you know, on television news uh, with with with, uh, with heavy machine gun, with with with, 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 you know, with, uh, with a great deal of, of, of weaponry standing on city the steps of city hall. And, that's you know, that's what they thought of as a big political expression. Yeah, they put a lot of effort into that. Um, I just wanted to take a couple questions. Well, I just wanted to I thought of one more thing. I mean, one thing you, you might have been suggesting is that there were, in fact, uh, gay Marxists at this time formulated themselves in, 
uh, organizations like Lavender Left. And I'm not really the best person to, to speak on uh, on this, but I mean, the you know, I'm sorry, Red Butterfly or also. But they're a little bit later. I mean, they're, they're certainly a '70s kind of thing. Uh, and also, you know, if you know, if, if no one here has really heard of gay liberation or you know, think that that movement's marginal, I mean, certainly, sure, that, like, the gay like Marxist left, you know, is much more marginal. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's mostly strong in Great Britain, uh, uh, which is you know, the national case that I'm, I'm most familiar with in, in the United States. Um, uh, so I, I will grant that. Um, there is, is this um, attempt at trying to grapple with uh, the problems of, of sexuality and, and the left uh, that it's certainly worth revisiting, but, but I will say that in terms of the predominant uh, strands of liberationist thought that probably predominates in the presence uh, in, in the, uh, the form of uh, so-called anti-assimilationist groups uh, like the uh, queer activists uh, uh, that I referred to in my presentation, I mean, I think that they're much more driven by Concepts and, and formulations derived by much more of the mainstream um, gay lib sort of milieu that uh, that I outlined. Take this question here. Um, so, how I gathered uh, your how how I took your uh, talks was basically on finding the premises premises that um, from which uh, these movements started that led to their ultimate failure um, and by taking that fa the failure of the, of, uh, the movements either through um, uh, you know, uh, how the youth of uh, the student movements was co-opted by capitalism or you know, uh, the bourgeois um, aspirations of the gay liberation movement or uh, the criminality um, of uh, the ultimate criminality of, uh, of the Black Panthers and how that ultimate failure um, retroactively inflects upon the premises and, and shows the faults within the premises. Um, I think that that's uh, ultimately pretty dismissive of, of these movements um, in a way that would not, uh, that platypus would not ascribe to you know, Lenin. Um, in the same way, I don't think, uh, or from what I've seen. Um, and so why is, why is it that in the 60s, the, the movements in the 60s uh, and the new left, um, what is to be gleaned from them is why their premises are failures and not what there is a value within them. And in the 30s, it's what's a value in them um, and not why their premises are failures um, as much. Um, and I feel like, uh, and this might be um, just in the way that you guys have presented it, that it is uh, there are elements of kids, gays, and blacks. Um, and that treatment is uh, problematic, I think. Well, we in Platypus would never uh, say that, you know, we, we never take Lenin in isolation as, as a figure and lift him out of uh, history to treat him as, as um, uh, 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 himself. Uh, what, what we study is the, the Second International, uh, which I don't think anyone here would say was unproblematic or you know, rested on wholly perfect principles. Uh, it was a deeply uh, ambiguous um, and uh, deeply divided movement um, in which someone like Lenin played a part in giving shape and, and form to the divisions internal to it. Um, so similarly with these movements, we're, we're trying to get a grasp on the dynamics of, of the movement formation uh, as a whole, or, or at least that's, that's uh, the way that my thinking was. What, what kinds of uh, uh, responses um, uh, is, uh, does gay liberation represent? What is it reacting to? How does it seek to understand its, its problem and its, its political tasks? And I mean, I certainly am willing to concede that they raised a difficult problem um, and uh, uh, did advance, in, in certain respects, uh, a certain heightened awareness or concern for the specific problem of, of sexuality, which uh, had, in fact, been submerged uh, by discourse on the left for a very long time. Um, but I mean, the fact is, is, is that these uh, movements themselves never really gained any kind of, like, institutional 
uh, Anchorage, um, they failed completely on their own terms. And by uh, members of these movements themselves, they failed. They self-liquidated and assimilated and became mainstream. And the problem, and so I mean, we're pointing out something that you know, people who tr treat this uh, history much more affirmative, uh, uh, affirmatively than we do uh, are also aware of, that these movements have failed, that they have sold out. Um, it's just that uh, I would say that... Um, the characterization of the failure I think is different. Yeah, the, the characterization of, of the failure is, is just different. And I, I don't think that our intention was, was to be dismissive, simply to approach the history uh, from a critical point of view that's different from the prevalent interpretations. Let me just add something. I think you know a lot of what we do in the group is sort of examining you know, historical cases on the left, attempts to change the world, right? and the limitations that these movements and these, these historical actors faced, and the way in which they were either able to you know, adequately address these these limitations, or you know, they were beaten by them, defeated by them. And uh, it seems to me that in the 1960s, one of the big limitations was the inheritance of you know, these problems that weren't resolved by an earlier period of historical actors on the left, including you know, historical figures like women, including the Second International. And so I think that, um, you know, and I actually think that I was not being dismissive of the Black Panther Party. I thought you were, I thought, I thought and actually the... Um, I was. Anyway. Yeah, I thought, I thought that, I thought that the, the, yeah, the pressure I mean, was to be more dismissive. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that, like, what's important to glean from the history of the Black Panther Party is not that they were, like, you know, the advocates of, like, these these uh, community service programs, and that's the inheritance that we should get. Neither is, is the fact that they were just, you know, rampant, violent um, people, and certainly there, there was a lot of that in the party, but that the individual, a, a leader within this movement, sought to address problems in the world in this particular way, and that he, you know, was able to digest historical limitations of this moment in such a way that we may take those problems up in a different way um, and, and thus sort of reconsider them. Um, I hope I wasn't being dismissive of the kids because I'm, I'm relying very heavily upon them. No, in all honesty, they leave me very little to add. And, and, um, and, and I appreciate um, the, uh, in, in, in some sense, answering my questions for me. Um, all I would add is that uh, I don't think that, I, I'm not trying to say that the youth were co-opted by capitalism. I'm saying the youth were created by capitalism. Uh, that the, that, that the, in, the emergence of the discontent is the fact that, that it, it is the ongoing presence of, of capitalism's contradictions. There. That, that, that there's still the possibility of reconstituting politics. Uh, and that the question is one of, uh, is in a sense a, 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 a practical political question of, of what do you do with a failed politics, people that have been produced by the failed politics and that are unlikely to be able to fight themselves free in that failed politics. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I think that that's why C. Wright Mills is, is talking about it, that he's so, uh, Relieved by the formation of the New Left Review and the, and the reading of this book uh, that, that occasions the, this piece out of apathy, uh, which is essentially um, Alistair McIntyre and, and E.P. Thompson and a few others. And and, and, and um, the reason, the I mean, the the question of the it's not a dismissal; it's a question of the inadequacy that, that there's a accompanying implicit within what we're saying. Uh, is a, a recognition of the full scope of, of, of the full scope of what an emancipatory politics could mean in capitalism, right? The full scale of the emancipatory potential that capitalism is generating, right? And so when 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 there's a I mean, that's what it's not exactly a static metric because that potential is in some ways um, in in some ways it's it's felt rather than known in some ways. It's, it, it, I mean, we, we, we know it because of these movements in some sense. We know it because of the history of the left and the way that we apprehend that history. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, so the question is not one of dismissal, but of, that's why I put it in terms of bringing theory to bear 
profound practice, right? Actually being able to create history rather than be blindsided by it, so that you end up in the position as as Pam and Greg were talking about of of having people say, "This is not what we meant." Uh, these movements have created something that is completely contrary to the intentions that we originally formed. And why were we unable to act? Right, and we believe that they were unable to act because of, in fundamental ways, because of their inability to understand the context within which their action was taking place. Um, okay, I'm going to take just two more questions from there, and then Marco, Marco, make it good because you're the end. Oh, you know what I'm doing? Okay, well, the pressure is on you. I want to make more of a quick comment, which might lead to a question, but I think what seems like a critique of the premise might seem, I think, um, we're not just critiquing a failed politics based on their own self-professed uh, goals and aims. But we're critiquing the aims in themselves. Spencer brought up this paradigm of uh, realistic and utopianism, but I would argue that they're also um, less utopic in their aims and goals themselves. And that um, kind of shrinking of what is thought to be possible would be understood as a symptom of that failure as well. Um, Black Panthers call for or understanding of a need for a kind of separatism, Black separatism politics is a is a um, kind of lowering the bar for what's that to be possible. And that lowering the bar understood as a symptom of the struggle. Yeah, I mean some yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, that's why what Ian was saying is important because uh, what wasn't sort of brought up in the in, in, in the panel that maybe a lot of us could take for granted because we've been like, studying it and talking about it, uh, is you know, the, the long generation of the old left that the, 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 the led to this kind of uh, uh, situation in which, uh, you know, the, the sort of natural response was to sort of mi misrecognize it and reject it in all kinds of ways. Um, and, um, and to repeat its mistakes because, of, you know, the, the, the generation was so like far advanced that it was hard to recognize what it had originally been about. I mean, I can't imagine how hard it would have been to become like, you know, uh, uh, Trotsky or something like that in 1968, or, or anything better than that. Either. Okay, great. we'll give you a lot. Sorry. Um, no, I was just reminded of something that, you know, I was talking to Pam when she was preparing her presentation, and she called my attention to this text that um, she was quoting from, which is the, the speech at Boston College. There was also a sort of follow-up interview that he did also in 1970, uh, and what's interesting is how a certain kind of recognition of the radicalism of Marxism, in other words, he's looking at Lenin and saying, oh, Lenin wasn't just for the workers, he was trying to facilitate the self-abolition of the working class and a radical transformation of society, that that led, the interesting thing that came up in our conversation was Newton versus Cleaver. And if Cleaver is like more militant, in certain respects, than Newton. What's interesting is that once Newton recognized the utopianism of the old left, it actually led to reformism. Because what he did was he reconfigured the whole question of revolution, and he decided that, oh, well, dialectical materialism will tell you that the revolution doesn't happen, but it's always happening, right? And so this kind of elision between capitalism and socialism, which is interesting. In other words, he was saying, capitalism is changing things all the time. It's really radical. And so we don't have to make the revolution. We just have to sort of nudge it along or sort of meet it in some way so that his drift into certainly personal degradation. But if we take like him seriously as a political figure, he drew the conclusion of dialectical materialism, studying the Bolshevik revolution, looking at Lenin, that he should like support the Democratic Party because the revolution doesn't happen. It's always ongoing, right? And so it's kind of this interesting kind of inversion happens and it happens as a sort of corollary to the, to the militant turn. In other words, what Cleaver does is go off into more and more gun battles. And Newton is like, oh, the old left was more radical than I thought it was, and that means I can be a Democrat. You know, it's like this bizarre paradox. <clears throat> and, um, and I think that Greg also uh, talked about how this kind of happens in terms of constituency politics and the idea of <clears throat> power, like empowerment, and consciousness, and how you know a certain kind of recognition, like in other words, we could indict the new left for lacking a recognition, and then the degree to which they achieved a recognition, they sort of liquidated themselves politically. Yeah. And that's an interesting, you know, 
in other words, the, the, the militants like Cleaver, um, I mean, he liquidated himself in another way. He became a born again Christian and a Republican. Right. Um, <coughs> but, just, yeah. Yeah. Give the last kind of remarks and then we're going to be done. My, um, yeah, my last remarks. I, um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, the utopian character of, in, of Newton's thought, mm -hmm. the moment in which this party is going, the organization is going through this existential crisis, I think it was a moment of recognition for him but that there was no vehicle in which that recognition could sort of have an effect on the world, right? And so that he reverts to a more conservative um, uh, politics, which are the politics of the Democratic Party machine, as a way of you know, still having a utopian vision but making certain concessions to the present. And it's actually the way in which he conceives of it, like the service programs, the community work, the infiltration of the black church by the Black Panthers, they were all seen as concessions toward the pre for the present. And um, I think that that's, that's important to keep in mind, that you know, he wasn't entirely affirmative about his own practice. Um, and so, you know, again, I just raised the, the quote again, you know, of Huey P. Newton sort of recognizing the impoverishment of his own historical conditions and then sort of, you know, what, what is it that he would say to us you know, in, in the present as far as like our own historical possibilities to really think through the kind of hopelessness that he may not have been able to sort of follow through, you know, the recognition of hopelessness that he may not have been able to follow through its logical conclusion and, and what kind of politics could be brought about through that recognition of hopelessness in his own moment. In the 1960s, it was an extremely, extremely dark time for, for politics, although in the contemporary political imagination is hailed as, as the glory days. And in fact, as, as I tried to make clear, the conditions of, of regression, um, uh, this complete uh, destruction and, and meltdown and transformation into counter-reaction of, of the international left really paid its toll on all of these movements by um, uh, stripping them of any radical continuity, of, of any um, uh, real vitality. In some ways they had to reinvent the wheel, and, and they did so um, uh, extremely, uh, extremely naively at, at, at times, such that they would pull and, and pluck and, and try to construct theories that, when looked at retrospectively, just aren't that uh, convincing. I think that the, um, uh, like the retrospective accounts of, of gay liberation uh, uh, era uh, style politics, insofar as it completely embraces this politics as uh, intrinsically good, uh, just you know really has to uh, make ridiculous claims like like Sherry Wolf, for example, talking of of the uh, the White Knight riots after Harvey Mudd's assassination, claims that it was a great moment of of working class solidarity because you know the gays were like throwing bricks in like shopkeepers' windows and like you know shopkeepers oppressed. Working class people, therefore, you know, gays were behaving in solidarity with working class. I mean, this this is honestly like the kinds of posturing that people have to take to recognize the fact that these were extremely, um, uh, extremely weak, extremely young, extremely naive movements. And let me just you know describe, uh, or at least let me just repeat how I described um, regression as the left self destructs and it's like a slow destruction, like this uh, destruction of the Death Star. No intellectual, <laughs> no intellectual or political uh, actor can escape the clutch of regression. Vocabulary shrivels as concepts and the words to which they refer disappear. Political discourse coarsens and petrifies. Analysis transforms into a set line. The understanding loses itself in surface phenomena. Activity degenerates into theater. I mean, we have to take the condition of, of politics in the 60s as a period of extreme weakness. That's not something that we should just respect. It's, it's a condition that we have to analyze and understand and hopefully supersede. If I could, yeah, if I could just pick up on this. Um, and to try to read it. <laughs> 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 um, does, does the star explode? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry, Spencer. Sorry. 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 Um, to revisit the, the, the inadequate response that I gave to, to, to finish out the question and to this other thing that's here. Like, what Chris was saying reminds me of, like, about Eldridge Cleaver and, and Huey Newman. Um, it reminded me of this passage that, that I was quoting at the end of, uh, from Adorno, um, where he talks about um, 
you know, the, the horror in the face of, 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 of this kind of actionism and, and violence driving you into the vicinity of reformism, which you know to be complicit with the problems that you face. Um, and you know, the way that he names the task of the present as fighting their way out of barbarism. That um, this situation, and, and I think that this is, in a sense, the, 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 the gesture of generosity uh, towards the new left, is that this situation is unprecedented. Uh, the problem is, is that they thought that it was just a matter of reforming the left, um, that, that there was an old left and that they needed to somehow and that even got into a lot of willfulness questions of this. Um, whereas the real question is, you know, is the, you know, we sometimes ask ourselves, so, so is this like this, or is it like, is it like 1848, or is it like regression to a kind of pre-bourgeois revolutionary state, or, or what? But really, it's none of those things, right? It's, it's really a, a situation that in some sense is uh, in some sense, you inherit the highest moment of revolutionary insight, which, you know, is, is, as Benjamin says, is sort of the clock that keeps on ringing, and it's there, right? It's in the present. The fullness of the, of, of, you know, the, the revolutionary potentiality that existed at the moment when people were actively trying to bring it into being is infinitely greater now than they could imagine. Uh, and at the same time, you're living in a neo-feudal world that doesn't even seem like capitalism at all. It doesn't even seem like it has the possibility of freedom whatsoever. And so if you're, you're caught somewhere, uh, you know, you, 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 it's impossible to kind of locate and orient yourself within that context. And, and, and you know, so you ask yourself, you know, why do they fail? Uh, it's, you know, at a fundamental level, the question is recognizing the depth. Right, and I think that um, you know when you when you do uh, recognize the death of the problem, you end up saying things like Adorno concludes that, that what I quoted with which is you know, what helps is deeply obscure. Okay, so with that, we'll uh, conclude. Um, thank you.